uh, Tony Blair launching what of course is his last election manifesto as Labour Party leader and Prime Minister. Now a stable economy, more personalised health system, greater parental involvement in education, stricter immigration, some of the, the key plans Mr Blair is proposing for a third term. But there are other issues highlighted in what is indeed a 110 page booklet. Now on transport for example, Labour plans to invest £180 billion of taxpayers' money over the next 10 years. It's aiming to reduce congestion by expanding the M1, the M6 and the M25 and introducing carpool lanes. On the environment, it's promising radical action on climate change, aiming to reduce carbon dioxide emissions in line with the Kyoto Protocol. Well, to have a, have a look at some of these points, which are often overlooked in favour of the big headlines, the tax issues and so on, we're joined in the studio now by Andrew Davis, who's from the Environmental Transport Association, Katie Elliott from Friends of the Earth, and Ian Byrne, who's from the National Energy Foundation. Very good evening to all of you. Andrew, Hi. first of all, um, uh, the risk of falling for the headline issues within these, I imagine people will think about the M1, the M6 and the M25 and, and widening. Funny enough, we heard the Green Party in its manifesto only yesterday saying you should scrap the road building scheme altogether. But what, what do you make of uh, the, the Labour manifesto on this? Well, it's supposed to be radical, but if you look at the transport aspects, it's very mild. There are radical possibilities out there that other countries have already pursued. There's nothing much here. There's, there's a bit of inspiration here, a bit of aspiration there. But in practical terms, not much is going to happen. The widening of those motorways is only going to end up making larger car parks. The M25 is already notorious as being Europe's largest car park. You can't uh, cure the problem of congestion, which for most people out there is the biggest problem facing transport, without some sort of control on the way we drive and when we drive. But if you, if you, uh, I mean, what, what do you make of how much of the manifesto Labour gave to transport? I mean, what is it? It's about a, about a page and a half, I suppose. Well, very little. I mean, obviously, um, education and health are very important, but if we can't get anywhere, those, are, those don't work for us. If we can't get to the schools and hospitals, we have a big problem. We're snarling up in this country. 50% um, of uh, our congestion is in the southeast. We're overburning. Other countries have managed to start doing things about that in radical ways. It's not um, difficult to see where the way forward is. The government can do it. Let's say the first thing is to do is to make uh, transport much easier for pedestrians and cyclists. That doesn't mean we don't have any more road building. The Dutch build more motorways than we do, but yet they've got cities where 40% of the population cycle to work. So it's not as if there's a, a one or the other. We need to make our roads a lot more safer. We're talking in, they're talking in their manifesto of cutting road death by half. But in 1997, when this government came into power, uh, the Swedes had a, a much more radical vision, which was no deaths on their roads at all. So we're going, we're behind the, the trendsetters in the world, and this isn't radical. They, since Alistair Darling became Secretary of State, he has masterfully okay. kicked all the issues into touch. I mean, he was on the back of the podium platform, of course. There were other departments on the front. Katie, um, yeah. let's move on to climate. Uh, yeah. That's even less than a page and a half. On the yeah. manifesto. We, we were actually quite pleased um, with the words that they use um, in the manifesto. We didn't expect much detail. It's obviously a manifesto and, and it will be outlined. Um, we, oh, he, we he, crucially saw, sorry, the recommitment to the uh, the target, the 20% cut by 2010, um, and that was something that of we carbon were, dioxide yes, emissions. From, that was critically something we were looking for. Um, we also mentioned um, on international negotiations they're going to be the pre president of the G8, and we're going to look mm -hmm. at our leadership on climate change. Um, and we also were pleased that it was integrated throughout the manifesto, um, especially in the economic section, um, explaining that climate change will actually affect um, economics. It's not something the costs of inaction are actually far greater than the costs of action. So, but but however, we do have um, you know. They haven't uh, delivered all the way through. Um, well, and he, Tony, they, they write in the manifesto here, actually, first, climate change is one of the most pressing challenges that the world faces. And Tony Blair uh, said that this, this was about radical action. Yeah. Now, I would imagine you would agree with the former. Do you agree with the latter? Well, 
as I say, there's not much detail in the, in the manifesto, and we're hoping that there will be more detail. Um, as I say, they're fine words, but it does need to be followed up with action, and the domestic action has been disappointing up till now. They were mentioned about the Kyoto targets. We are actually at risk of not meeting our Kyoto targets, um, and we do need to get back on track. It's mentioned in the manifesto, um, but we'll be looking for a strong um, review of the climate change review programme of the government this summer. OK, Ian, you were nodding your head in agreement. Yes, so. I, I feel very much that there's very little action there. Uh, in fact, a lot of the action that came in the last parliament was as a result of one or two private members' bills going through. Uh, I'm not sure if it's really a policy to rely on that sort of bill. It would be much better to see more commitments in the manifesto. I mean, for example, they talk about renewable energy and their programme of renewable energy. But to be honest, it's almost collapsed at the moment. Clear Skies and the PP Solar Grants, which are the two main small-scale grant schemes, have a both very uncertain future. They mention energy efficiency really only in one place, and that's in connection with the new building that's going on at Thames Gateway. Yes, there's a lot that can be done in new buildings, and indeed should be done, and indeed in Milton Keynes, where I'm based, we have a huge amount of uh, experience that we'd like to share elsewhere. But there's very little about energy efficiency in industry, or about energy efficiency in ordinary... Even transport. Um, the, one of the problems uh, we find, we're, we're a motoring organisation, our members, uh, when they break down, are talking to us about the practical problems they face as they drive around. They, they're quite happy and would want to buy cheaper cars, but the whole taxation system we have at the moment is not penalising gas guzzlers. Now that we can give, the government can give signals to gas guzzlers that they are, are, are going, uh, performing problems with climate change and, and road danger and so forth, but they don't put the signals through the tax system. How do you compare the Labour manifesto to the Conservative one, which we've already got? Lib Dems, of course, is tomorrow. I, I would say there's, there are more, there's more paragraphs from the Labour one, but it's equally as bland. Oh, right. Uh, I don't think we could object with anything in either of them. Um, the Conservatives have steered very well clear of anything contentious like nuclear energy or wind. Uh, and so, from my point of view on energy efficiency, that's quite positive because it's about the one thing that they can say they're in favour of. Just going back to that point on renewable energy, uh, we would like to see, the government has ha had some good policies on renewable electricity, but we'd like to see policies on renewable transport fuel and renewable heat. Um, and those are two major components of an energy policy, and our government tends to just focus on an electricity policy. So that's very narrow-minded. Do, do you not find that, I mean, you talked about carbon dioxide emissions, global warming, uh, that the government has gone for something which is a relatively easy hit for them? Because, of course, meeting, I mean, because of what the Conservatives did with the coal industry, it's a lot easier for Britain to meet the Kyoto commitments. Well, in a sense, yeah, the, um, the, um, we met our Kyoto commitments in 1999, um, largely because of the dash for gas and the markets, as you mentioned. Um, and yes, it, it was an easy hit in that way, but it just shows that we don't actually have control of our emissions. And we're at the mercy of the markets and what the markets um, do depends on whether we, we hit our carbon dioxide emissions. And we think government really needs to take control of this. I mean, we would advocate having carbon budgeting across sectors of each of the um, government departments. So it's not just down to one small government department to take okay. all of the wrap. OK. Have you all read the manifesto from cover to cover? No. Pretty <laughs> much. <laughs> I've just got three pages of it there. <laughs> and of course, Conservatives uh, already out on Lib Dems. You've all got to read tomorrow as well. Right, well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Katie Elliott and thank Ian you. Byrne and Andrew Davis, thank you very much. Thanks. Now then,